I'd like to introduce our first panel discussing jamming and spoofing, emerging threats to aviation cybersecurity. Here to lead the discussion is ALPA's Aviation Security Chair, Captain Wolfgang Koch. Hey, Wolfgang. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Captain Wolfgang Koch. I am the Aviation Security Group Chair for the Airline Pilots Association. Today, I've assembled a panel on GPS jamming and spoofing, emerging risks to aviation cybersecurity. GPS jamming and spoofing has emerged in the last year as a major threat to flight crews. On October 17, 2022, there was a multi-day jam jamming event in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which denied GPS approach services to this airport. More recently, spoofing in Europe and the Middle East have resulted in flight crews receiving terrain ahead warnings while cruising altitude over the ocean. Effects beyond confusion with navigation include false GPWS alerts, loss of ADS-B, inability to use data communications, and denial of entry into the RVSM North Atlantic Track airspace systems. We have assembled a panel of FAA and industry experts to speak to us about what can be done to lessen the impact of GPS interference and what is on the horizon that will improve the resilience of future aircraft. Now I would like to uh, like them to introduce themselves. Ken. Thank you. Um, I'm Ken Alexander, Chief Scientist for Satellite Navigation Systems at FAA. My first experience with jamming and spoofing was as a 19-year-old flight test engineer with the 4950th Flight Test Wing at Wright-Patterson Base, Ohio. Um, I have experience uh, in the Air Force as I'm a retired U.S. Air Force pilot uh, with 26 years experience, uh, multi-engine and uh, instruments. I have been with the FAA now for 22 years. Um, I have worked a lot in spectrum issues, uh, including radio altimeters. Some of you have had some experience with change out of equipment there. Uh, certainly, this is a challenging issue, and I have worked with the vulnerabilities of GPS, avionics, and aircraft systems, and testing uh, our business jet airplane uh, over the past uh, five plus years. Uh, and we've been working on mitigations now uh, for over five years to have solutions that are now starting to become available in the next couple of years. And hopefully we'll improve the situation as we do uh, quick solutions in the very near term that hopefully it will help with operations and technical problems. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Over to you, Sean. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, Sean McCourt with the MITRE Corporation. I'm the mission area lead for aircraft and avionics. Um, my background is, is similar also as a pilot, but on the civilian side. So I have a corporate regional airline experience, was an ALPA member. So uh, a very, very strong operational background in avionics. Recently, though, for the last five years, uh, I've been working very much on the operational side of, of GPS interference and resiliency, looking at how do we not just detect, how do we operate through, how do we come out of, and again, if you particularly think about it like a weather event, right, coming out of them can be the hardest part, right, how do we recover? So we've been working an awful lot in, in near, mid, and far term, leveraging work Ken and others are doing and capabilities they're bringing to the table to figure out how to integrate those into an operational response um, to ensure we are compliant, we are safe, we are efficient, okay, and secure. Thanks, Sean. Patrick. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. This is, a, this is an incredible opportunity. Um, so I've worked with uh, Collins Aerospace for 30 years. 
Um, started there in 1994 as a co-op. Um, as, a, as a side, the, actually the reason I wound up there um, is because I, I think I failed as a pilot. Um, I thought I was going to be a professional pilot. I wanted to be in the audience in this room, you know, <laughs> looking on because I flew a big, you know, big heavy somewhere. Um, uh, failed a check ride um, flying a hold over an NDB with a 30 knot crosswind. It didn't work out real well. Um, many of you probably know how difficult that is. Um, <laughs> when I got to ground, I thought, well, I'll take the second best job in aerospace, which is if I can't fly them, maybe I'll help build them. Um, so I started working for Collins Aerospace and uh, actually started working in IT. I worked in cybersecurity for the entirety of the time that I've been there, um, working within first our DT organization, then moving over to our products organization, starting in mission systems. And then for the last 12 of those years, I've been working in uh, our commercial systems branch, now what we call our avionics organization. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the RTC ASC 216 committee that drafts the design specification for cybersecurity certification of aircraft. Um, uh, we also publish a set of additional standards that support that, including um, continued airworthiness and uh, event handling and management. Um, two years ago, or three years ago, um, going back even a little further, we wouldn't have considered GPS jamming and spoofing to be considered a cyber event. As a matter of fact, there was language that kind of de-scoped it, pushed it outside of the scope um, of considering a cyber threat. Um, but, you know, the field has changed, the, the nature of flying has changed, and the environment has changed, and so um, we're very much pivoting to consider that, and it's part of the scope of our, uh, some of our current work. Thank you, Patrick. Now to one of our own, Chris. Thank Please. you very much, Wolfgang, for taking the time to organize this panel. Uh, my name is Chris Cedor. I'm an uh, instructor with United Airlines on the A320 series of airplanes with uh, ALPA within the ASO on the Aircraft Design and Operations Group Chair. What does that do? Essentially, we help uh, advocate for the membership of ALPA for anything that is installed on the airplane, helps you fly the airplane, or is the airplane itself. Um, I've been doing the work for about 10 years now. I started uh, about 10 years ago doing uh, ADO work with Wig Turbulence. Uh, flew the CRJ back then. Uh, had a couple years where I was able to fly the 747 overseas. And uh, now I'm back and been the chair of the Aircraft Design Operations Group for about 10 years now. Uh, we are very involved throughout the industry in advocating for long-term solutions to this problem. I'm sure we'll get into some of these topics here soon. Give back over to you, Wolfgang. Well, I thank you very much. I look forward to uh, starting this round of questioning. So uh, this will be a question for all of you to answer. And I'll start off with, when we started seeing more widespread spoofing, aside from bad GPS positioning. What were the other effects on airplanes at this point? And Ken, we'll start with you. Certainly, so um, it was surprising that we saw timing spoofs uh, fairly early on, and timing spoofs uh, start cutting across different aircraft systems, uh, communication systems, networks, uh, so that uh, prevents some of the outgoing uh, not just data link, but uh, potentially even SATCOM. The uh, aircraft use electronically steered antennas to point the antenna towards the satellites, and if the airplane is position spoofed, uh, it can not be pointed towards the satellite, but also if it has a timing spoof, all the satellite communications, all, a lot of the data link communications are all synchronous communications, so if you have a timing spoof, uh, it's not going to synchronize because it's uh, delayed and it's not in, in synchronization. But also if it's one to two weeks old, the data message, uh, the ground system is going to view it as worthless and not going to process it. It'll throw it away as garbage. So we're going to, I bet you we're going to hear a lot more about PNT, position navigation timing, that uh, I've seen actually one of the pictures where uh, aircraft that are flying after being spoofed where the clock is actually just zeroed out and doesn't have a reference to time. It can be zeroed out. It can actually, you can, in some instances, you can, the pilot can see it turn backwards. That would grab our attention very much. Uh, so. You can also see, also see variations in ground speed, uh, totally ridiculous ground speeds, extremely fast. 
faster than the speed of sound, or static, not moving at all. You're locked onto a spoofer or, or maybe just a repeater if you're not moving at all and you're in the air. That's, uh, Unless you're a helicopter. <laughs> Most troubling, I would say. Sean, over to you on the question. Yeah, to pick up, I mean, everything Ken said, and, and we'll add a few on for the audience. You're an educated group, so uh, think about position, nav, and time. Time is, and date. So we go to great lengths. Everything on an airplane that has a database is generally using that database. It's, it's pulling position. Where am I using that database to drive systems, right? Um, the use of time, if you think about time and date, think about you've got a nav database on board. What happens if I tell the airplane all of a sudden it's two months ago? So, so these are the, the things we're starting to think, you know, well, these things have never happened. We weren't certified to these kinds of things. So will the airplane revert? I mean, we, there's a should, the, the airplane should do something, but do we know it in every airplane, in every configuration, at every operator, under every different type of interference event? And so you start thinking, well, what happens if it was two months old? Or it's the database now thinks it's three months before the database is valid. Are you flying along without a nav database? So what's the impact of that? Or the multiple databases on your airplane? So, so we have those, and then you have these kind of more subtle pieces where you could have modes. So you know, think about your databases again and think about radar. You know, sometimes radar, we've, we've built fantastic radars that now know we're over water, give you a better picture in the cockpit because it knows you're over water. So I'll make sure that you fly safely let's say through, around, and over a thunderstorm because you're over water, I know that signature. But if the airplane now doesn't know it's over water or the airplane thinks it's over water, you know, it's over land, what's the implication in the cockpit? So uh, synthetic visions, safety systems, modes, submodes of safety systems, let alone your big ticket items like navigation and, and comm and things that Ken just mentioned. I understand there are 16 PNT systems on board a 350 that could be affected on any spoofing event. So I'm paying attention. Patrick, over to you. So maybe I'll give a little bit of the engineering thinking process and bring in cybersecurity. When, when we look at systems and design modern systems, and, and there's been a lot of evolution in this space over the last 10 years in thinking about cybersecurity in the system, we do, we, we often, many of us in the industry practice engaged in a practice we call threat modeling, which means you take your system and you have to start with defining what's the attack surface of the system. And, and to do that, you look at, well, what can be manipulated on the outside of the system? And so you can see now GPS falls into that fold, right? It's one of the represented antennas on the aircraft and the outside of the aircraft. And then you look at, well, where does, once that signal is manipulated, how does it flow through the system? And so we put together what we call data flow diagrams and signal flow charts and, and evaluate how does the signal move throughout the system and who consumes it? Because ultimately in a large aircraft, um, you know, you'll have that time signature, right? That'll be published on a, on a 429 bus or it'll be published on a Airing 429 or uh, AFDX word. Um, in the system and then everybody is consuming that and all those consumers trust that signal and they trust where it came from, right? Because ultimately the problems that we're having with GPS was a flawed recognition that we built a system with a single source, right? We trusted this one source, we got sold on the notion, we sold ourselves on the notion that GPS was such a fantastic thing that we failed to ask ourselves the question of well, what happens when that gets spoofed, when that gets altered, when the signal gets manipulated. And so that's really where we are today, right? And looking at these systems and understanding how time flows through them and then what level of trust does it place on that time and how does it use that time? And it's where the resilience is, right? Yep. On, on a one system basis, I don't think any of us really want to fly with one system. Nope. Can you have something well, to add? Yeah, certainly, because we, used to have independent communications, navigation, surveillance, and air traffic systems, and safety systems. And now, with the element of timing spoofing, and data spoofing, and position spoofing, we have risks to communications, surveillance, ADSB, ADSC, uh, navigation systems across the board from maps to whatever safety systems, and should the emissions 
be above the ground, then some of the air traffic control systems are vulnerable as well. Common IT depend on GPS time. So time is the common denominator that runs this world. Uh, and there are dependencies in lots of systems on GPS and GNSS time. So that is the common denominator that we really have to attack as a nation, as a world, and, and we're working on it, but it's a challenge. Well, we're gonna be discussing some of those challenges as well. Right. Chris, uh, last over to you on, on this. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the things we're seeing is as the technology is developing and we're seeing more increased complexity in the um, avionics and everything being put on board the airplane, we're seeing more um, intermingling between the systems. And yeah. when you have one of these spoofing events, you might think it's just a navigation thing, but we're seeing these all the way down to even the ACARS. Um, there's been reports of, of events that were found out because the ACARS time was a little bit off. And when they went back and looked into the event, found out that it was actually spoofed. So as we move forward, we're gonna to continue to see more uh, complex systems in these airplanes. And we need to pay attention to how we're gonna address that. And as you said, Sean, over there, we were, um, we thought GPS was great, and it is, don't get me wrong. It's an absolute fantastic system. But there are, there are problems with it, as with anything, with any technology, it can fail. Well, and we do need to watch for that, and as we're intertwining this more into the airplane and into the architecture of the several different systems that are installed, we need to make sure that we have the ability and we have the procedures, if this happens, for the pilots to pull out the QRH or pull out whatever um, guidance they are given by their airline to be able to recover from the event. Some of these systems, one of the systems that's quite commonly affected by these are the TOTS. You can be flying along at 370 and all of a sudden you're getting a pull up, pull up. And the problem is too, once that system goes off at a high altitude, when you know it's not true, do you even trust it? We don't know if it, when you get out of the spoofing or the jamming scenario, it may not fully come back. And even if it does come back, can we trust it as a pilot? And how do we have the integrity um, or reliability in the system to know that the uh, system is working correctly? And that we're seeing that in more and more as we're seeing more designs coming forward, that it, everything is just so intertwined in these airplanes today. And it can be expected to be seen in more systems uh, without any issues. So Chris, I'd like to follow on with a question to you regarding this, but uh, what key messages would you like to communicate to the membership for your view as the ADO chair on behalf of the ongoing so, issue here? A, no, absolutely. Um, the biggest thing I could say, and I know you, most of you will probably uh, hate me for saying this, but make sure you're reading all of those emails that you get all the time. Um, we're learning a lot about this as we're going on, and we're working with the OEMs. There's an industry-wide collaboration trying to come up with mitigation for this. But as we're getting more into this, these procedures are developing, they're changing, and they might even change from operator to operator. They're going to change from fleet to fleet. And this is always going to be constantly updating. So the biggest thing I could say is make sure you're paying attention to what the current procedure is. If you don't have it in your QRH, which will be the ideal situation, maybe a pilot bulletin or some other form of communication, and you want to be able to recover, identify the situation, and use the procedures to recover it. GPS jamming and spoofing is not new. It's been around for a long time. It just is getting a lot more attention recently. It even does. I know um, at a lot of airlines uh, that have narrow body and wide body fleets, some of the narrow body fleets might say, oh, it's never going to happen to me. It happens all the time in the United States, too. But th that would be the biggest thing I would get um, passed along to the membership. Pay attention to the operational messages of Correct. the aircraft that you fly, and specifically maybe even the, the location or theaters that you're in, I would say. Correct. As we see, most of the spoofing and jamming is occurring where drones are being flown in a, uh, in a, a conflict zone area. So, yeah, and even when we progress through an area as such, the effects linger on the aircraft, right? Yeah, and there's no way for us as pilots to really determine is the system fully back functional or not. So that's where we have to come in, we have to start making those judgment calls following the procedures we have to say, hey, we just had a jamming or spoofing event. Is this system back reliable to what we might need it to do? So that, that's uh, also part of the troubling 
message, I think, or, or operational procedures that we have when, when we don't know that there's been something out of ordinary and we go to fly across the North Atlantic track system and we don't have the RVSM capabilities. And that comes back to maybe at some point from where the aircraft has been and had been spoofed or jammed. Yep, correct. Big problem. So Ken, that, that goes, go ahead. More concerning to me would be that you think you have the RVSM capabilities, the capabilities to fly on the NAT tracks, but perhaps you still have degraded navigation and other factors where you probably shouldn't be. And you're just not aware of it. Your AMP shows good, but in fact, really, it has residual error in there that's still present. Uh, very concerning. So, Ken, that would lead to a question to you as a regulator. Where's the government interaction with the foreign countries on developing uh, processes and procedures to? Certainly, uh, we worked uh, for a number of years very closely with the European Union. Uh, we have a, a work group, engineering work group, that has been uh, addressing these type issues uh, for well over a decade. Uh, so that's at an official level, and and so we we're, we've done a lot of the planning that led to the current work by RTCA Eurokai on new avionics standards and help advance that. Uh, certainly, we're helping advance it at ICAO. I chair the Navigation Systems Panel at ICAO. I'm also a member of the ICAO advisory group on cyber security to the council. Uh, and certainly they um, are watching this issue, but we are trying to get a coalition of the industry folks to work together and to find common solutions as well as proprietary solutions that can help and help advise the operators how to handle the issue in the short term as they work towards uh, solutions that hopefully can be software or firmware upgrades, eventually then followed by hardware upgrades um, they, uh, that will, of course, take time. But I see the manufacturers responding. Uh, they are working hard. And, and I'm hopeful that the solutions start coming out soon. They will not come out all at once. Uh, it will not be a big bang. We need a layered approach. And it's not that we can't trust GPS, it's just we don't know that we're receiving GPS. We are receiving false signals. And it's not just combat zones. These counter UAS systems proliferate all over the world. And some of them are not just doing jamming, they're doing spoofing. And they're not just spoofing GPS, they're spoofing all the constellations and all the frequencies. So that is a threat and we're encountering events at various places around the world. Um, approximately 40,000 events uh, is what has been estimated for the month of 15 July through 15 August, 40,000 events. Fortunately, most of them are in areas where it's not US flag operators, but it is north, uh, western manufactured airplanes and uh, Airbus airplanes predominantly. And it's also a lot of U.S. passengers flying on foreign airlines when it's not on U.S. carriers. So we have a lot of equities in solving this problem. And it doesn't matter if it's a U.S. flag carrier or a foreign carrier or a U.S. manufactured airplane or foreign airline. If we lose an airplane because of workload issues, because of this problems we're encountering, compounded with an emergency, that is going to be a horrendous event, and that's my feared event. Patrick, I heard you mentioned something about RTCA and your work with the committee there. Can you uh, go yeah. into a little more detail? So, um, actually, RTCA is, uh, has a standards committee around, GP, around GNSS um, navigation and the development of those receivers um, that they, uh, they work in combination. Uh, in parallel with their Euro-K counterparts. And the, the working groups are uh, Special Committee 159 and Working Group 62, I think, if I get the numbers right. But they, they draft the standard, what they call a MOPS, Minimum Operational Performance Specification. So when we develop design system, um, design radio receiver, um, we have to show compliance to that MOPS, that performance specification. So they're iterating in their current terms of reference, they're iterating their standard to define seven grades of jammers and spoofers. And so as the grades go up from one to seven, it 
it uh, acknowledges a different capability of the adversary that's doing the jamming and spoofing, and that that core translates to, um, you know, are, are they spoofing a single satellite? Are they spoofing an entire constellation? Are they spoofing multiple constellations? Are they doing it over multiple frequency bands? Um, what you know? What is the level of capability that the aircraft is encountering? And then the when this is complete, um, it will set a standard for testing and evaluating all these systems before they can be certified to go in the aircraft to have a level of resiliency against these kinds of jamming and spoofing events. Um, and so the industry gathers around that and we actually have uh, representation from the airlines on some of those committees talking to my colleagues. I believe that um, Delta and American and United all attend those meetings, but they're always welcoming and looking for additional input and additional support um, from the industry uh, and from your organizations. Um, on the cybersecurity standards side within our SE216 committee, um, the standard we draft uh, is really a process specification on evaluating how to evaluate threats and how to mitigate them through the engineering process. And so I mentioned threat modeling and how we embark upon identifying risks in an architecture. And so as we roll these out and we're evolving to our next standard, uh, we're evolving from uh, the DO326 standard to the, uh, from the A revision to the B revision. Um, it has a peer standard in your okay that's uh, ED202, uh, which will also uh, evolve from A to B. Um, but the language is changing in that document to acknowledge that GPS is, is a potential threat and how you manage that and how you evaluate it needs to be considered and negotiated with your certification authority when you go through. And that's an aircraft level, right? And so that's going to change how when we go to certify and you go to certify an aircraft, the conversation with the regulator, how resilient is this system, that drives testing. Right? That drives testing at a system level, not just the radio level in, in answering a MOPS, but in an aircraft level, a system aircraft level, which means we need to conduct testing. And some of that has already started, but it's going to become more uh, consistent you know, with more and more aircraft to make sure the systems are evaluated. And that feeds a few things. It's one, it's not just a technological assessment of whether or not something happens, but it's also feeds into the processes and procedures that are given and passed on to the pilots in terms of what do they do, right? This is not a just an engineering problem. It's a people process and technology problem. And we need all of those to work in concert in order to resolve it. Um, I'll go ahead and Sean if you want to yeah, add something. I, I think picking up where Patrick's saying, you know, over time we will we'll engineer the problem, right? We will, we will, the airplane will get better. Our dependency and use of these things will improve. Patrick will solve it for us, uh, right? And, and that's a good thing. But in the meantime, what, what, what tools do we have in the toolbox to deal with this? Training and education, policy, procedure, right? And if you, if you think about that, you go, that, that's, you know, that's what we could do now. That's what we're doing here, right? We're, we're, we're you know, educating in a way. Uh, but, but that's what, you know, what we can achieve and need to achieve till we get further down the road. And then we can amend the training policy and procedure to accommodate the new aircraft and new systems. But I think, um, you know, it's not just an overseas problem. It's happening here in the U.S. Okay, it just doesn't typically happen in Dallas, but it did happen in Dallas, it happened in Denver. Okay, it happens frequently, or more frequently, I shouldn't say frequently, it happens more frequently at smaller airports to smaller airplanes, uh, avionics shop has a, has a repeater that they forgot to close the door and, and it interferes with some, some Cessna 172's taxiing out. That doesn't make the news, that's not massive. But there's no reason that same scenario can't happen somewhere else. Um, it's the church pastor who wants to jam the cell phones. It has nothing to do with aviation, but it affected aviation, right? The truck driving down the highway with the jammer affected aviation. So, I mean, these are the things we're going to experience. And I think we were talking earlier today, if you think about it like a weather event, right, today. So how do we get out of this? How do we deal with these variations? You say, right, well, if it's Cat 3, and I'm in a Cat 3 airplane, and I'm Cat 3 qualified and equipped, and everything works, and we're all good, and we're going to go in and land. We're, we'll, we'll do this like we usually do. 
If I'm an airplane that day that has an MEL, and I understand that, and I have a, I have some, a book I can go to and a QRH tells me what I can and can't do this day. Well, now I got a choice. Do I hold for the weather? Right, so here's the operational piece. Do we hold for a while, then go in, see if it gets better? Do we divert? Can the system accommodate us for that? It's one thing to kind of do that out in, I'll, I'll say, a place like Dallas where you get lots of airspace. Let's go up to New York and say everybody wants to hold for the next two hours to see if this GPS event goes away. Oh, and it's IMC and my TAWS is going off. Are you going to continue to shoot that approach in IMC with your TAWS going off? So we, these are things, though, these are good questions for you kind of people to go, yeah, well, we can think about that. We can, we've, we've done this before. We do these things. We deal with irregular operations. And in the meantime, we'll tackle it. Right? And we can tackle it, but we've got to get that training and education, understand what's going on, what are the possible range of characteristics. It's not always CAT 3, sometimes it's just quarter mile visibility, a little bit of rain, no big deal. So I, at this point, I'd just like to interject that it remains, again, two crews, two pilots in the cockpit. And I think we stick with that as uh, far as we can always here. So, Ken, you did want to add something as well. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, the new standard for GNSS inertial systems that we completed in 2020, uh, the claims table for spoofing protection uh, that was included in there is proprietary. So the actual performance of the device is not open so that the threat can uh, reverse engineer it. They would have to purchase and test the device. They possibly do that, but they can't just look at the specifications and say, okay, well, I need to do a ramp or a jump of the size and I can defeat it, uh, because it's prior to that device. Uh, same for the new uh, receivers. Uh, when they're produced, there's seven different levels of spoofing that can be addressed, four are mandatory. The actual performance against all seven by those manufacturers is proprietary. They can disclose that they choose to their airline customers, but it's not open to the public for inspection. Also then for antennas, we have advocated to the federal government, to the State Department, the other agencies, for jam and spoof resistant antennas to no longer be controlled by trade restrictions. And we are hoping for a federal register notice to uh, announced that there's some changes coming in that. It's not been released, but we're hoping for that soon. Uh, and we'd welcome it. And we've been investing money with the Navy Patuxent River uh, Nav Air Testing Facility to help develop standards to equip the commercial airplanes with those type of antennas. That's about a good breath of fresh air that I've heard in a long time on this subject. Uh, like to see that list come out. Yeah, it would be treated just like inertial systems or TCAS or anything like that. It would be something that is commercially licensed. Very good. So th would you consider that a uh, short-term fix, long-term fix? Or oh, we'll have to get the think? standards and we'll have to get equipment that the uh, airlines want to buy. <laughs> oh, it boils down to money. But there's now a, uh, a little bit of a demand. That's been the problem so far with inertial systems. Standards have been there since 2020, but there hasn't been a demand for them. Now perhaps there is. Patrick, you want to add something? Else? So I, I just wanted to pause and, and circle back to something John said here about uh, thinking, creating a parallel to how we think about weather. Um, I don't know if you follow ops group. I actually get follow ops group quite a bit. I get folks in our G, GPS uh, receiver group sending me and forwarding me to those emails all the time. What's interesting when I go and I look at the map that they produced, and there are several versions of this map that are out there uh, that show you the GPS jamming and spoofing events, and you can look at it in a 24, 72, 48 hour window. Um, what strikes me about it is it looks like weather, right? Yep. And, and, and in our world, that we operate. It, it's, it's an excellent metaphor, not in, in terms of procedure and process and how we handle it, right? It affects the entirety of the system, right? It's an RF interference. The RF interference has an effect on the aircraft, right? It's not affecting the, the flight characteristics. It's not affecting the, the wind over the wings. It's affecting the RF that the aircraft has become dependent on. So that RF interference has characteristics to it, right? 
it has behavioral elements. You know, what, is it a jamming? Is it a spoofing? Is it just hitting? How big is it? How broad is it? How strong is that signal? How powerful is that signal? These are all characteristics of that interference, right? Well, if we think about it that way, we can start to think about how we instrument processes and procedures to manage it like we manage weather, right? You go and you look at a chart and you look at what's the history of that chart. What's the weather been moving? What's that pattern look like over recent days? And what's that tell us about where it's going? The same can be thought of in terms of GPS and GPS interference maps, right? Are they coming up? Are we seeing an increase in this element? It gives you a sense of risk in your planning of whether or not that can occur or whether or not it's likely to occur. And then we can characterize it where, where it exists, right? We can learn things about it and do things about it. So I, I hear you saying there's a, there's a, a degree of risk within an operational area, but then there's the insidious one-off occurrence that occurs somewhere. And that's the one that uh, I think we would all be more um, worried about. Well, and you can't, you have to have a plan for that too, right? right. There's, there's the pop-up occurrence, just like you have a pop-up thunderstorm and, or you have a sudden wind shear event or a sudden downdraft, things that you did not expect. There needs to be a process and a procedure for managing that as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that we're looking at doing um, additionally within, within the systems. There's a lot of sources of, of uh, navigation data on the aircraft. There's a lot of sensors today that are not fully the information they provide is not fully integrated into that resolution, right? There are things that we can take advantage of that are already pre-existing in the aircraft that will help with this process. You've got, I think, the DME sensors, you have ILS sensors, VOR sensors, NDBs, all of these things. You know, the NDB that failed me so horribly in my check ride. Yeah, that could be a relevant part of the picture again uh, in terms of it gives us precision information, right? We can get... Um, multi-frequency DME systems that we can correlate data coming off multiple DME, DME sensors to correlate information and data and accuracy information that will give us not, addition, not only additional points of accuracy, but additional points of evaluating the signal that we are getting from GPS. And so our things that we can do that are, are software modifications that don't require major uh, equipment swaps in the aircraft, right? There are multiple stages to this problem, but it will never get to the point, I don't think, that it's wholly handled by technology. Uh, it, there's always going to be a pilot component of Again, it, right? two pilots yep. in the flight deck. I do think, you I know, hear that loud and clear. The, you know, the notion of, in, in my world in engineering, everybody's freaking out because, oh my God, AI is going to come along and write all our software, right? And Google or whoever, right? And, but if a company, there's two ways to think about I've reduced workload. And one is I don't need that person anymore. I think that's a bad plan. The better plan is, oh, well, he doesn't have to do this function as much. There's a whole lot of additional things they could be doing to increase efficiency, increase the safety of the system. Excellent. Chris, would you like to add anything that you'd like to maybe uh, express to the membership on behalf? Of no, absolutely. Um, the biggest thing is, as we're developing these procedures and as we're learning more about jamming and spoofing, um, we're in a constant revision here. As aircraft are evolving, we're putting new technologies on the airplane through STCs or other means, and we're seeing the more interconnectivity here. Um, we're going to see more procedures, we're going to see more policy and ways that we can deal with this problem. When you're flying along at 370 and all of a sudden the jip whiz comes along, it's not a good day. Um, there's, but as pilots, and we are the ones that have to come back, make the decision, and make the choices to safely complete the airplane. How do we do that? We follow our procedures, we follow our um, QRH, hopefully in this situation, or whatever uh, you might have at that time, but there are times that you might have to go out there and make that decision. Is the system reliable? Is it not reliable? Can I continue on with my original plan? So that, that's the biggest thing is just be aware of this. It, it happens, and as I was saying, it, this is not a new thing to happen, and it does happen in the United States. Of course it does. Yep. So uh, I'm going to throw this out. A uh, general question here again is, uh, generally speaking, 
what's the vision for the future resilient navigation system? Ken, I'd like to start with you on that. Sure. Certainly, uh, I view it as a layered approach. It's uh, multiple sensors, as was discussed, being compared against each other. That's guidance that we wrote into the TSOs and the aircraft installation guidance in 2014. 2014, 10 years ago. Uh, it's, it's common sense. I mean, if you have uh, an aircraft that's flying and it's supposed to be on RMP4, and you have a change of position that's 20 miles or 200 miles, the airplane shouldn't accept that. You as a pilot shouldn't accept that. You're a question, what's going on? Why is your map now showing you over land when you were over the ocean or vice versa? Uh, maintain situational awareness. If you're not comfortable using nav aids, get comfortable using nav aids. They are your friend. Uh, you can triangulate off those and they can give you a check to see, okay, am I good? I, yes, I know I was in a spoofing area. How bad was it? Does this look like I am on the right radio at the right distance at this waypoint or not? And, and if you're not familiar with doing that, please uh, practice it. It's not that hard and it'll give you a comfort and it won't take that long to do. And, and just do it occasionally when you are in doubt. Don't, don't be in doubt, check. I've always liked using the term uh, radar vectors, please, right? That, that's a good way as well. <laughs> uh, air traffic control can cross check. Uh, they can't do it with great accuracy, but they can do it within a couple of miles. So. Uh, would you um, agree that there's still the, the basic need of having ground-based navigation systems? Certainly. Uh, the heart and soul of a layered approach is some sort of ground-based nav aid. Right now, it's uh, distance measuring equipment, DME, area navigation. Uh, most avionics can see uh, six to eight DMEs at one time. We need to better enable aircraft to leverage and get credit for the DMEs uh, that they can see and the performance that the DME ground systems provide. The aircranes don't all have operational approvals to do uh, area navigation with DME inertial and they need to get that. So that's something we'll be working to complete uh, so that the uh, air traffic controller doesn't have to deal with, okay, well, 60% uh, of the fleet in my area can do uh, DME RNAV but the others can't, so therefore I'm just going to cancel all area navigation. That's crazy. I, I do believe in best equipped, best served. That seems to be a term that some people don't like because it does create a little bit more workload to understand what your airplane can do as an air traffic controller. Very good. Sean, how about you? What do you see for the resilience? I think, uh, I mean, to pick up on, on the, the nav aid piece too is that uh, first of all we've got a diverse fleet right we we still have a glorious 727 flying out there uh we you do. know some some md80s <laughs> here and there and then some things from, of that vintage or, or those vintages 73 classics uh all the way up to the airplane that came off the production line last week right and, and so the capabilities are, are you know we we need to have a system that that can um can use all of the various elements of the, of, of the nav aids, um, but be applicable to the wide range of fleet we have. So back to what Ken was saying, you know, what are the tools, so it becomes what are the tools in the toolbox against a range of fleets? And, and I think it's important too to think about uh, the FAA has, has enabled a, you know, a minimum operation network of DORs. So when GPS is out, they've got a plan. They've got capability out there. They, they can make sure that if you're IFR and you're in your 172 using GPS, I think it's within 100 miles, I'm not the expert, uh, I haven't read my AIM lately, but, uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, 100 miles from you is, is a conventional approach. You can get there. You can land. Yep. So back to Ken's point, as long as you're proficient, let's hope you're proficient and your equipment's working. And the same thing as you move up to, to, to what are the next-gen DME airports, right? right. And so, uh, you know, so we can explore, you know, the more we can use DME, the FAA's invested in DME. They're ensuring they've put more DME in. They've added DME where DME were needed. Excellent. So if we can keep... You know, we get, keep in mind that those tools are available. Those tools are available when we go into this irregular rock. Um, and where are those places? You know, when you're holding in New York, you know, let's say in those scenarios, where do you end up going when you can't get in? You go, to, you go up to Stewart, you go over to Bradley. 
Guess what those are? Those are DME, you know, next-gen DME airports for a reason. You know, they've been picked. So mm -hmm. I hear like it's a backward compatibility, same thing as we have in, uh, when we design a uh, hardware system in, in an iOS system or a right. phone system, it's backward compatibility, right? Yeah. right. And, and as Ken said, with the opportunity to, to do more with it, right. right? the new airplanes are going to leverage those even better to be that complementary nav system. Uh, I think that's you know, excellent segue. Patrick? So I, long term, it's, again, you know, people processing technology. Um, we are looking at uh, you know, next generation GPS receivers. The industry is trying to figure out what they can use for additional constellations. There's a heck of a lot of satellites up there now, right? Uh, many of which can provide a time signal. Is it the level of resilience that we need? Is it the level of availability that we need? I think there's a lot of things that we need to do to figure that out and make a determination about that. Um, but the industry is working to coalesce on, on what is that vision for next generation GPS to for the purpose of resiliency, right? You think about that and, and then being able to use enhanced technology in our antennas to make sure, you know, get some things that are off our ITAR lists and make them technology that we can use in civil aviation and repurpose them. Those things exist today, right? We just need to classify them in a way that makes them usable for civil aviation. Um, and then as we build up the systems, test them, simulate them, and do that with a pilot in the loop, right? This, it, like I said, it's not going away. And it's just one of the many signals in the aircraft that could be manipulated. We need better testing and simulation with pilots there where we can develop procedures and we can look at what the system impacts when a system or a signal gets deviated uh, in a manner and, and, and what does that do so we don't wind up in this position again in the future. Right. I just heard a, a startling figure that uh, in six years time the Starlink uh, and we're not just only Starlink but the entire satellite systems around the earth are going upwards of 42,000 satellites flying around there. Just a stunning figure that I heard. There's, but. you know, also think there's evolution to the internal navigation positions, inertial systems, right? They're wholly internal to the aircraft. Yes. They don't rely on an external signal. Another area of technology is the advancement of the inertial sensors and to be able to make them hyper accurate, right? And so again, that's another technology that will evolve along to become part of that integrated future resilient navigation system. Excellent. Chris? Yeah, so sp specific to the GPS system for navigation, I think one thing that we could see in the future at some point is moving from this reactionary approach that we have right now to a more proactive approach. The problem is, how do you figure out it's proactive? The bad actors are, have found a uh, security vulnerability. They are going to uh, continue to exploit it. These are, these are going to continue to keep happening. So when you have the human element on the ground that is causing these to happen, how do you get proactive? And that's one of the difficult questions to have on there. Um, one of the things could be some kind of alert, some kind of real-time indication to the pilot to say, hey, you are in an area that has been identified as spoofing or jamming. Um, some, but keeping the pilot in the loop is really what is key in here. Because at the end of the day, technology fails. And this technology is working how, it, how it's supposed to. Is a problem here. It's just having the location spoofed. It's not that there's an internal fault in the system. It's just getting a poor location or some kind of event on it. And it takes the pilot to be able to make that decision to, to identify the issues happening and then to make the decision on what to do at that point. So I think that is one of the biggest things that um, we will see in the future is some kind of identification and more proactive system here with these events. Two well-trained pilots. Okay, yes, and uh, Ken, you so, wanted to add one last Yes, yeah, so in addition to the uh, independent inertial systems, we in the future need to have independent clocks on the aircraft. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, very few airplanes have an independent clock system, and we need to be able to reset the clock systems, the navigation systems, in case for some reason they do become corrupted. Uh, right now, they, most systems cannot be. So we're gonna be flying around with the atomic clock. I like that, okay. That doesn't have to be atomic, but right. just independent. 
uh, wristwatch, the, not right. this one, but exactly. my mechanical one I normally wear. <laughs> if it's not spoofed. And of course I have a wind-up watch here, so uh, I will go back to one question if we would like um, from the back. We have a text message question. Yes, hi, well, thing. We do have quite a few questions. It's a great discussion, so nice job. One particular topic, we received a lot of messages. Uh, there is an online forum called Ops Group that has been publishing guidance and recommendations for pilots and dispatchers for spoofing. Should we be using this guidance, and what are the concerns? Excellent question. I'll give it to whoever wants to answer that. I'll go ahead and take Thanks. that one. So we are working, the industry is working with the different OEMs in how to address these issues. The OEMs have different approaches um, to it. Some OEMs are dealing with these on the operator specific level, going to the QRH, updating your flight manual, whatever version you have. Well, some are putting out more overarching guidance to the entire fleet of airplanes that are out there. Um, I would highly recommend sticking with what is your approved procedure and what you are told to do and what you are trained to do. Um, there is a lot of good guidance out there. There are a lot of good points being made. However, as pilots, we have to do what we are trained. Those procedures are vetted internally. They're vetted by the administration. They're vetted by engineering. And it really, that is really what I would say is stick with that. But that is good information to have um, to understand the background of some of these issues. Excellent. Ken, I, I'll leave it up to you to finish off on that. On the regulator side, what do you say to the ops bulletin or messages that have been coming out? It's been difficult to keep up with. It's been uh, fairly fast moving. I've, I've been in some of the video conferences and tried to participate. Uh, it's an incredible number of pages. It's been a lot of work. A lot of people have contributed a lot to it. There's some good information there. There's been some misinformation, uh, it's good background. Uh, but take it with a grain of salt, it's not perfect. Uh, the people who did it did it with great intent. And I think they've done a good job at capturing background information that's very helpful to get attention on this issue that's extremely important to all of us. This is a collateral threat that we're experiencing right now. And believe me, at some point, it will evolve to a targeted threat. There are people who want to do us harm. There are people who want to hurt our economy. Uh, it's not just nation states. There are a lot of factions and people within this world that have ill intent. And we have to deal with them. And we need to make ourselves resilient and be responsible in how we act. So please be secure out there and fly with two pilots. Perfect. <laughs>